Oh my gosh. Thank you everyone for being so patient with me. I find a lot of irony in that me as like the tech one has the tech issues. So I apologize. There's some really good content coming your way. So it'll make up for it. I'm using my roommate's computer. We figured it out. I'm here. I was just giving an intro um, saying who I was and then uh, how you do dream kit and you have so much expertise on this. So we're really excited that this is your unfortunately last program you're going to be doing with us for now, but um, we're excited that you're going to be doing this program because I can't think of another person that knows this topic more. <laughs> Thank you. And, and everyone, I'll put my email in at the last slide, happy and open to like answer any questions. The journey of app development is really intimidating and there's, uh, I did, I couldn't find a lot of mentors in that space. So happy to, happy to be that for you and kind of anything that you need. Although my position with the library is going to be phasing out, like I'm such an open book and open resource uh, to share the highs and the lows of what this, this has meant. So uh, I think to reiterate what Colleen is saying, this presentation is for people who have no technical background like i'm not going to teach you how to code during this next hour but what i am going to do is help you think about if you have an idea how to sell it through an app perspective and how to get people on board how to build a team how to um really pitch your idea through an app lens so that's me i see that we're going live on facebook so hi everyone on facebook and hi people who here in the in Zoom. Uh, my name is Marina Manmolejo. I'm the current uh, EIR, so Entrepreneur in Residence at the New Haven Free Public Library. And today we're going to be talking about how to build an app for your business. So to reiterate, it's not for people, uh, it's for non-technical founders or non-technical entrepreneurs. So with we that were, being- We were finding that a lot. Um, we have a learned code program that we hope you'll be interested in. And we have a lot of people that um, they started a build, build an app uh, focus and we were getting so much feedback on that but a lot of people were overwhelmed because the, of the coding aspect so we decided to offer this as another way for entrepreneurs to understand like apps can help your business and it doesn't take coding experience to get the start of it like idealized and mm -hmm. understand it and plan for it and then you can always hook up with someone who does code or a service that does code to put this into into production. Exactly. So Colleen, if you can allow me to share my screen, I'll go through my slides. And then for all of you um, here in Zoom, Colleen's going to be monitoring the chat. So there's a lot of content to get through. My goal for today is just to touch a lot of concepts. It might feel overwhelming, but just let it sink in because the best usage of our time right now is just for you to be, to be exposed that there are so many free resources out there and then you can do some work on it later. So goal is just to introduce you to a lot. If you feel overwhelmed, then maybe I did my job right. So- And I was saying we will send this information or as much as we can yeah. out afterwards if you registered. Um, so you won't have to take as many uh, notes. If you feel like we're going too fast, you can always put that in the chat and we can reiterate. If you have questions, please put those in the chat. I'll be watching and we'll just interrupt and say, okay, take a break. Uh, we have a question and um, we won't make you go through the whole thing and then ask your questions. You can ask while we're going. Beautiful. Okay. So with that being said, building an app for your business. Already went through introduction, so let's get started. Um, but I first just want to thank Ellen Sue, uh, who was at the Sci Center for Innovative Thinking at Yale. She has been like my mentor in all things app development. She hosted a workshop called From Paper to Prototype. So this is where a lot of the slides come from. Uh, so thank you, Ellen. Okay, so first I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of how we talk about app app developments. There's some lingo that I want you all to be familiar with. Uh, one of them or two of them namely are UI and UX. They're acronyms for user interface, right? How, how does the app look? Um, kind of the design, the feel, the beauty, the aesthetics of it. And then UX is user experience. I'm sure we've all downloaded a clunky app that we've deleted before we even created an account. That means they had a bad UX or bad user experience. So obviously the two go hand in hand, right? If you have a beautiful app that's easy to use, the UI is good, the UX is good, um, progress is happening. Um, and in some, some situations you could have one good, one bad, um, and that's it. So UI and UX, two things to, to think about. And then the process of creating an app, 
isn't may maybe what you think. Uh, there's a lot of pre-work that goes into it before you even touch screens, before you even talk to developers. Um, the best way to spend your time is putting in so much effort at the beginning so that when you communicate your message to developers or devs for short, down the road, you know exactly what you're talking about. You've tested your idea. You've gotten feedback from your customers. Um, so the beginning is mapping, right? And we'll talk about this in more detail, but this is just a roadmap of the presentation. Uh, mapping in terms of user personas, right? Think about who your end user is, right? Is it uh, population 70 plus? If so, let's create some big buttons. Let's not have a lot of words on the screen, very image-based, uh, but maybe if you're targeting, you know, Millennials or Gen X, then you know your 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 screens are gonna look a little different. So mapping first, understanding user persona personas, wireframing, which I'll get into. It's kind of like storyboarding if you're a writer or into Hollywood at all. You know, you storyboard a movie or episodes. This is exactly what wireframing is for the app world, uh, and then. Right, what, visual identity and branding. How are we really messaging and marketing our app? Go back to wireframing again in a high fidelity standpoint. <laughs> Export just means use one of the softwares that I'm gonna teach you all a little bit later that's free to prototype your app, test it out and iterate. Fail, grow, learn, iterate, and that's, that's the process. Marina, okay. I have a question. I just wanna throw this out there. If you wanna share in the chat why you, what kind of business you have or why you're attending, what kind of app you have an idea for, we would love to know that because that might help uh, frame examples that we can give you throughout this presentation. Would love that, right? Like, are you trying to create, I mean, my friend KCM is trying to do a like boozy cupcake business, right? So for her, she can use an app and sell like whiskey infused cupcakes. Whereas mm -hmm. for me, like my app is designated towards young people who are experiencing homelessness, very two different customer bases. And so the storyboarding, if we want to kind of um, go into this would be different. Um, and so when I talk about storyboarding, User personas is you as the founder or someone with the idea, your leadership team coming together and having a brainstorming session and really figuring out who is your end user. Your user personas can be anything from the back of a napkin to this very, you know, aesthetically pleasing write up that you see on the screen here. Uh, again, right. So in these personas, you're trying to find out who are, who are the real users and what are their pain points. So basically barriers or problems that they're experiencing. Why are they going to go to your app and not the competitors or not, you know, a, through a different avenue? And so in these personas, it, it might sound like, oh, that's easy. I know who my customer is. But once you really have to write it down, uh, it helps a lot to visualize. And then with these personas, put them up in the office, throw them up wherever, you know, if you're working from home, just make sure you're always visualizing and remembering why you're doing it and who the end user is. Um, talks about behaviors, right? You'll see demographic information and user personas. Uh, and they're basically a way to generalize how users are making decisions and then what features you should focus on when designing the app. So again, there's links in here that you'll have access to um, a little bit later. Personas continued, right? So once you start having users on your app, you might get some feedback and say, hey, my user personas before we introduced actual customers was very different. So we got to go back to the drawing board and change it up a little bit. That's helpful and useful. And that's really emphasizing that whole narrative arc about uh, the life cycle of your app. Um, and then I want to also recognize that personas have limitations. They absolutely rely on your assumption as the founder to start you know, brainstorming who your user is. And we're all biased. We all have specific lived experiences. So in that brainstorming session, if you can get a diversity of people to really think about who your customer is, it's going to help you out in the long run because we all have blind spots and that's something to just recognize. Um, Marina, we have two comments um, in response to our question. So Tara was saying that um, coaching and leadership slash success training business is the idea for the cool. app. And um, Wileen was saying that education app pairing state learning standards and resources with target audience educators homeschoolers and students. So very education-based and then uh, leadership-based uh, ideas. Oh, okay. Beautiful. I, that, those both sound very people-based. And so when you're creating these user personas, um, think about who your customer is for education-based. Is it the teachers? Is it parents? Is it students? Is it uh, 
people statewide, right? Decision makers on board of ed. And if it's all four, three of those, four of those, that's perfectly fine, but you would need diff different personas based on the different customers that you have. For DreamKit, uh, the app that I founded, we have young people who are experiencing homelessness as, as one user or client, and then employers as the other one. And so the screens are gonna look different, how you're thinking about features, how you're thinking about, um, just usability, they're going to slightly differ based off of this person's experience. So I think the last assumption that I'll touch on is that you can absolutely spend way too much time in this process. And although that's great, like just keep it pushing because your user personas are going to change inevitably once you get out there. So um, yeah, test and launch your, your app as soon as possible. Okay, another example that you'll get access to, but these are good languages and um, I think layouts for you to, to think about. Okay, workflows are basically <laughs> when you are thinking about your app and the actions that your users are going to, achieve, to take to achieve their goals on the app. Um, so for example, like these are brainstorming tools that can help generate ideas uh, and connect you to be able to like iterate more often. Um, so that's what I want to say about workflows. They're, they get more visual as the slides progress. So I'm going to actually hold off on some of these comments until a little bit later. Um, the last resource that I want to tell you all about is mind map or mural. So they're kind of like decision-making tree softwares. Uh, and here's an example on this next slide about your workflow of the app. So what we've talked about so far is you know who your customer is through your scenarios. Uh, and now you're thinking about, okay, how are they moving through the app, right? When they download, they're gonna have a login screen and then what? And so this is your way to kind of create decision trees because your development team is going to need to know, tell me the entire user experience so that we can kind of build this out. And so that's what I'm talking about when I say the word workflow. So we're going back a little bit. Um, this is you telling the story of, of your app. You're setting the scene, you're telling the who's, the how's, the why's. Um, and, and these workflows don't have to be beautiful. You just gotta get it all on paper. A couple other tools are uh, Omni, OmniGraffle, Canva, uh, mind note. I haven't used those, but I, I definitely recommend mind map. It's app. It's free and mural as well as, as softwares to map out what your app experience looks like. Here's another example of what you can create on those two platforms. Uh, and now let's talk about the app, right? Let's talk about the screens, what they look like, and that's wireframing. So you can have a low fidelity, basically meaning you again, on the back of a napkin, drawing out an iPhone and sketching down what you want your screens to look like. And then you have high fidelity wireframes that there's free softwares as well that I'll talk about. Uh, but basically your wireframe is a skeleton, bare bones of your mobile app. And it lays out very key elements that you need without getting too, uh, too ahead of yourself because the wireframe is really what you share with your clients and say, hey, we have this idea. This is roughly what our app would look like. What do you think about it? And just this is the part where you get a bunch of feedback from customers. Maybe you have some technical developer friends who you can get feedback from. Um, and the benefit is that it saves time. Your app will change. So do not be married to some of those maybe features or screens or colors at the beginning, so it's gonna change. Uh, so the wireframe is good because it's bare bones, saves time, reduces the number of decisions that you have to make. Uh, it helps you see the logic of your app and it's easy to test, it's easy to prototype. Some A bummer or some cons about a wireframe is that they're not pretty. And so if you are like type A needs needs aesthetically pleasing things at all times, it's, just, it's not a wireframe and that's okay. Um, and they also don't give you a feel for what the app will visually will look like. Um, and so you, you have to be okay with that, at least at the beginning. I have a question, Marina. Mm -hmm. um, between mind mapping and wireframe, is, is the wireframe more of a visual mind map? So it's- Love that. Love that. Thank you for okay. that clarification. Yeah, yeah. When you're so yes, please ask questions because I think when you're in it, 
you know, if you ever had professors who are just so ingrained in their topic and can't don't really ex explain the difference between the two. Sometimes I feel like that. So yes, Colleen, uh, mind mapping is words, right? What is the path of your app? And so, for example, on DreamKit, we you have to say, okay, when a young person who's experiencing homelessness, they download the app. What's the first thing that they see? And if they choose to on DreamKit, you can learn skills. So if they choose to learn some skills, how would they then get back to the home screen, right? Or if they decide they get money on DreamKit as well. So if they decide to cash out their you know, wallet, how would they then get to activities? And so you're connecting verbally and, and you know, you can map things out so you can have lines that kind of connect to each other, uh, but with words, how everything comes together. And what you'll find is sometimes you lead your user down a path and then there's no really way of looping back to the home screen or looping back to a search bar. And so uh, those dead ends are inevitable, but it's good to see them, see them out on paper before you get to that visual aspect that is wireframing and kind of drawing out what you've laid, what you've laid the ground for. And so all of these terms, right? Workflows, mind mapping, wireframing. Once you work with you know, computer scientists, developers, you know, IT software folks, they'll know exactly what you're talking about. And you'll feel good coming to the table, having said, like, I did our, our user personas, and this is our wireframe and yada, yada, yada. Here's our prototype. Um, yeah, it's better than being like, I like this app. Can it be like this app? You know, yeah. it's a little bit more in depth. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. And um, there's two people, we'll get to this when we, we talk about building a team, but there's two types of people that you would want as someone who you know doesn't have those types of software skills. One of them are designers who can look at your wireframes and say, okay, I know the gist of what you're trying to do. Let me, let me beef it up and make it more beautiful for you. So those designers are for the, the UI, right? User interface. And then the developers who say, okay, let me take those designs and they write code for each design. And it's so cool. Like there's each color has a certain numeric value. So they'll just like be plugging away at the data code, all the visuals. Um, so yeah, we can talk about that after, uh, but this is, yeah, this is wireframing. I think there's another example. Okay, on the left, you'll see very nuts and bolts, sketch it out, doesn't have to be beautiful. The second one is when you, you know, convert to uh, the computer and there's some free softwares that can, you can like insert shapes and insert lines to get a better estimate of what you want your app to look like. And then the high fidelity wireframe would probably be when you teach yourself, like I did at the very beginning, how to use some of these softwares or you hire a design team or get some students. I, I'm, I feel very confident about how connected I am to the Yale entrepreneurial ecosystem and some other you know, Connecticut universities. So if you want student interns, let's have that conversation. Um, because students are dying to work on real world problems that are solving real world issues. So yeah, there are lots of places you can find these people that you are paying to do this, but also you can use free stuff like Canva you brought up um, to get the visuals and sort of the graphics and the way you want it to look yeah. based first and then yeah. give that material to those people. Exactly. And there's um, Adobe XD and Figma. If you can write those in the chat, Colleen, that'd be really great. Uh, Figma.com Figma is a website. Um, those two are free. You can go down a YouTube rabbit hole and teach yourself, but basically they already have the templates, templates of screens. And so let's say, okay, here's a screen, here's the dimensions, go ahead and add your shapes, add your lines, add, you know, add pictures, add whatever. Um, and you, you can actually connect your screens together. It's called prototyping. Uh, but you say, okay, when they click on a button that I've made on my fake screen, right, on figma.com, when they click on this, it's going to take them to this screen. And so eventually, you're essentially, you're, you're wireframing and you're creating an experience that someone kind of feels like they're using an app, but they're not because it's not on the app store. It's just, you know, on your wire, it's your wireframes and your prototyping, but you can get pretty like dang near close to making someone feel like they're using an app uh, without actually going through that whole process. Also, I recognize that I am a fast talker and I'm especially a fast talker when I get excited and I'm very excited about non-technical people wanting to build apps. So slow me down, I won't be offended. 
I, I was saying there are a lot of slides um, because I went through the slides and they're all so important. So if we don't get to everything, these slides we can give you and uh, definitely interrupt us and ask questions if you find we're going yeah. too fast. Your questions are more important than getting to the slides. So I'll say that. Um, a visual representation of what we've talked about, right? From sketching to wireframes all the way to the code. Um, okay, types of screens. Uh, this will help jog your memory. I, I'm assuming that when you go on apps, you're not thinking about, oh, when this person created, I don't know, uh, Headspace, right? The meditation app. You're not thinking about what that creative process looked like to build all these screens. And so this slide is an opportunity to jog your memory on all the different types of screens, right? You have a navigation page, a splash screen is just like a, hey, welcome. And, uh, log in here or sign up here, right? It's just the first thing that you see the splash screen. You can have- Marina, we actually have a really good question before you go too much into this. Um, what is the average cost in your experience to build an app? So to get in touch with these coders and these graphic designers and sort yeah. of like all encompassing, you come up with all these ideas, you come up with the prototyping, you've done all your work, then what cost would you say is the range um, of building this app? Yeah, 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 I feel so lucky because my design and development team are all students and they created such a like, I'm not going to cuss, but like rock star app for free. And so when we get grants, I prioritize giving them like a thousand dollar stipend just to like kind of thank them for their time. But I mean, I got this done for free and they they were like right now we're not expecting money but it's possible right and then on the other hand you can you can hire a development team for five thousand dollars to get an app off the ground um there's there's ways to negotiate so the more work that you put in right cr doing the wireframes making the screens as precise as possible the, e the easiest part in this process is for, for you to have perfect screens, you give them to a development team, all they have to do is put code to it. So they say, okay, this color goes to this code, this shape goes to this code, and they just write it for you. The hard part and the time consuming part and the expensive part is when, uh, you know, they're coming back and asking you questions, saying this, this doesn't, you know, maybe look good, or that you're, the way you mapped out these screens, there's a dead end. And so when someone goes to click on profile, there's no way to get to like a search bar. So put in the work up top and you can really reduce the cost from a development side. I was gonna say, it sounds like the more work you put in, the less the work they're doing and it, and it maybe they do hourly rates. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly, okay. exactly. So again, the, the more I think bugs that they see in, in the way you kind of written out your screens, the more time it's going to take them and the more costly it is. There are, uh, there are um, freelancers that do this stuff too, that you can yes. hire. So there's exactly. companies, but you can also exactly. be looking on LinkedIn. You can be looking on Google and um, try exactly. and find someone whose rates work for you. And I'm happy to help you. I mean, I have multiple professors that I'm either in contact with or reached out to me and said, hey, we're running a CS is computer science, like CS 101 class our students would love to work on a project. Do you have any local entrepreneurs that you know that they can like work with to build out an app? And I'm like, oh, this is literally free help. So don't get discouraged by the price. There's when there's a will, there's a way. Mm -hmm. um, there's the, it's a learning opportunity from both ends, right? From the students, computer science person's perspective and your perspective. Um, All right, I hope that answers the question and you can go back into what you were what you were going through. Yeah, 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 yeah. So again, just a list of screens to start thinking about when you're when you're wireframing, when you're going to like Figma.com or Adobe XD and using a computer to actually wireframe. Um, so you can read those messaging screens, maps screens, um, things like that. Again, types of screens. I like the picture on the bottom right. These things that you don't think about when you're using an app, but you have to think about when you're creating an app, for example, the thumb zone. So a lot of people are right dominated, right handed dominated. So when they pick up a phone, their thumb can only reach right certain parts of the screen. So as a, you know, someone creating an app or a designer, you would want to put the main features or buttons in that zone so that someone can use your app 
easily, effortlessly, uh, without using two hands. So things like that you'll never think about, but it's cool once you start digging deep into the world of app development and some tips and tricks. Uh, and again, a wireframe, so it's, it's, an, it's a process, that's for sure. We have another question. So is there a, as a second cost um, in your ex experience, is there a cost to host the app on the app store or elsewhere? So you, are you paying the app store to be able to host your app there or is it something that's free market where people are paying you to download the app or you're just hosting it there for free and it's a free download? Concept? Yeah, great question. With my experience, um, DreamKit is a nonprofit and so we don't, uh, we don't ask people to pay for the app when they download it. Therefore, it, it's we don't have to pay to host it on the App Store. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are taking profit from some people, then I, that's a different conversation. Um, so there's there's different levels. Other ways to make money is through ad revenue, right? Who are you partnering with to kind of show their ads on your app? Um, Revenue. As far as getting in contact with like Apple, with app stores and that mm -hmm. kind of thing, um, are you finding that there is a cost there involved um, that we have to keep into account? They have, and I love it. I love whoever asked this question. Uh, they try and make it as easy for you as possible. That's where my dev team, right? Developers, IT people, they're going in and kind of creating accounts with Apple and creating accounts with, you know, the, the, Google Play and Samsung stores. Uh, there's there's really no cost, and if there is, it's like a couple of dollars. It's minimal. I I could be misspeaking, so let me go back and I'll I will kind of share that out with you. But as someone who kind of sh signs the checks and does in <laughs> payroll every week, like we don't spend money on uh, the store hosting. There okay. is. I, I will note there's a legal price when you are creating your terms of and conditions and mm. kind of like user agreements. The library partners with you know, law firms, um, the entrepreneurial ecosystem in New Haven has legal support for people. Pro like bono that. as well, certain pro people bono, that, will, pro, that will help you. Exactly, pro mm -hmm. bono people. There's good people in New Haven on, from the legal side that wanna help us entrepreneurs who are really early stage kind of get off the ground. So with these costs that start popping up before you pay them, Think, like contact your local library, contact me, like let's figure out if there are people who are doing this stuff pro bono because when I tell you, I've been writing the coattails of pro bono like support for two years now, um, it's really, really possible. So I, I'm like a living representation that- That's interesting you brought up the terms and conditions and the legal aspect for that because I didn't I didn't think of that either. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you want to get that done quick and you have the money to, to pay some lawyers to write that up for you, that's great. Uh, there's other ways around that. So, yep, these are some resources. I talked about Adobe XD, which is this fourth one right here. Uh, and Figma are some good ones to do digital wireframing. So, you know, you're not on the napkin anymore. You're not on pieces of paper, but you're in the computer writing out the screens that you've already really thought about before. Uh, again, keep things as simple as you can. The worst is getting bogged down. I mean, I have stories. I've been in coffee shops when they were open for like hours and hours just designing a screen. And then when a user tested it or I showed it to other people, it just ended up getting wiped. So save yourself the effort and, and again, keep it as simple as possible, little colors, little styling because uh, it'll save you time when you continue editing. So now, user testing, um, again, right, we're not talking about you having this app already coded out and it's on the app stores and you're testing with people. When I say user testing, I'm talking about you have your screens, they're on a computer, you want to share it with some people. Um, and if there's, I'll save the last five minutes and I'll go online and show you what I mean um, when I say prototyping, because that's not necessarily in here. But again, yeah, so you're, you're, you have your screens, what they look like aesthetically, you're sharing it with people. These are important because you're testing your assumptions. When you're so deep in it, you forget uh, that looking at the app for the first time is a confusing experience for anyone. And so um, this could be a good way to test those assumptions. You find out what you're missing. You learn about new behaviors. Uh, you can learn about new features that need to be included on your app that you had no idea about before, and you discover more of your users' needs. 
I did actually, I don't know if you know this, Colleen, I did a user test for Dream Kit at the library a mm. year ago back. And so we, I asked, okay, we asked a bunch of young people in the teen center where I said, hey, come through, I bought pizza. <laughs> and like, we just kind of hung out and I had some, through the library, some iPads um, and they were able to look at my wireframes. And it was cool because I actually had, and this goes with the process, I had a, a list of, tasks that I wanted them to do and I didn't tell them kind of anything about DreamKit and that is your best bet when testing your app give them as little information as possible and if so they, they can, can figure it out if they can figure it out mm -hmm. without you kind of biasing them then that means you have a really comprehensive solid app screens right not Set everyone's gonna know this shape a button means this exactly or yeah and stick with the universal shapes right a home icon is for home screens or like a left pointing arrow is usually back like don't get creative mimic what's out there the best advice honestly that i got when develop when you know wireframing dream kit was someone who said hey think about what else is out there download that app, right? So for DreamCat at the beginning, we wanted to match young people who are experiencing homelessness with mentors. So I thought, okay, what's an app that matches strangers? And I was like, oh, the dating apps. So I like downloaded Tinder, I downloaded Bumble, I downloaded all of, all of these apps. And I would, I took screenshots of the you know, the screens that I really liked and wanted to mimic in DreamKit. And then on my computer, I just like threw those screenshots up there and tried to aesthetically design DreamKit screens yeah. in a way that mimicked what else is out there. These because it doesn't mean you can't be creative. It's just giving you like a, a hey, this is successful. So maybe base it off mm -hmm. of this, but then do your edits there. These companies have spent millions of dollars Understanding Testing. the psychology, yeah, understanding the psychology of their users. And that's the reason why they'll use certain colors, certain fonts, certain sizes, all that is intentional. Everything is intentional. Mm -hmm. And so if you can just ride off the piggybacks of people who paid, you know, the designers, the big bucks and use what they have. I mean, I'm not saying steal, but like absolutely mimic and absolutely feel inspired by what exists because it exists. At least with the basics, like I'm sure if you got the basics down, you can expand on the creativity from there and your exactly. logo is going to be creative and your color schemes are going to be creative creative and stuff but like exactly. as far as like the button icons and where you're putting them and whether you're swiping left and right I totally agree with that exactly exactly um it perfect uh so <laughs> when you're asking your users right people who your friends or you know who, whoever matches your user personas you say hey come through look at my screens and you give them a task so for us for me one of the tasks was uh go, find out how much money you've earned on DreamKit, and some people couldn't figure it out, other people's could. For the people who couldn't figure it out, they said, you know, some of these shapes aren't intuitive or, you know, we need more direct, we need an, a splash screen at the beginning that is like the directions of what are supposed to happen. So things will pop up, themes that you never knew you actually needed. So that's the reason, set a goal, set some tasks, and then um, only really ask a couple people to do it at the same time because there's gonna be so much feedback but you can't keep track of it if it's more than, I would say, even five people. Uh, again, yeah, define tasks and questions. What are you trying to answer? Some tasks uh, and keep them open-ended or specific. Uh, process, so there's two ways of understanding your user. One of them being more uh, qualitative, right? Hey, everyone, what did you think was confusing? What do you want me to clarify on? Uh, what felt hard to navigate, right? Some open-ended dialogue that should be included, but then also there's some numeric quantitative measures that you could be taking as well. Uh, one of them is A-B testing. So let's say you have a feature uh, that you don't really know if you want to include or not. So you can have a user testing and include the feature and then another group and not include it and kind of compare those two focus groups together to see you know, if that feature should be included or not. Mm -hmm. uh, a net promoter score is actually really <laughs> interesting to know. Um, everyone in the industry knows this. Everyone in business kind of is familiar with what a net promoter score is. And it's basically one survey question where you ask your user on a scale of what, what, one to 10, zero to 10, how likely are you to refer this app 
to your friends or family or people who you know. And I think it's like a seven or above, if that's your net, eight or above, if that's your net promoter score, then that means you know you have like a rock star app and you're on the right path. If it's anything below that, uh, th there's, there's room for improvement. So you can use NPS at any point in your business trajectory, and you can use them during your, your feedback sessions. Uh, I'll, I'll skip to the last one, heat maps. Again, the psychology behind app development is crazy. There's actually software where a user will go in to like, let's say a room and they have your app in front of them um, and they'll have goggles on or something where uh, the, the machine can test where their eyes are going to on your screens. And so then a, they'll give you a report about where most people spend, you know, the most time looking at your app. And so that's good for you to know if like you have this feature that's in the bottom left corner that you're really excited about, but everyone is looking at top right corner, then you know, you should probably move that. So again, there's a lot of room you here that with the uh, Canva and like graphic design. Like there's always like the rule of thirds and which colors stand out more. And if this text is bigger, but it's over here mm -hmm. and this text is smaller, but it's more important. You got to switch it. So that's really cool that heat maps do that yeah. in a yeah. more scientific way. And I just want to reiterate all of you who are listening now, your superpower in creating this app is how easy and seamless you can make it. And so it, it's mostly coming from a design perspective, right? And understanding your customer and what they want and what features and, and kind of like services that they need. So if you can communicate that through wireframes, you know, throw them on a, a computer uh, and kind of create those screens there, you have a really good pitch deck to go to to developers, right? And share them what your vision is. You can go to your students and kind of ask anyone if they want to join your team. I mean, if, if that's what you can create, you will attract resources and you will attract support because that's- if you are creating a pitch deck to get money to build this app or to get people involved. Having this as part of your pitch deck puts you leagues yeah. above yeah. people that don't have this stuff. Yes. So. yes, yes, yes. The human brain reacts differently when they can- feel, touch, kind of visualize something. So yeah, you're throwing your screens or even your wireframes up there in a deck. It's just, it hits different. Yeah. Um, these are some things you can use um, in your feedback sessions. You can look at that later. Uh, feedback sessions are incredibly important because they help you iterate, right? So what are we doing well and what are we doing wrong? Um, you can go back and redesign your wireframes. Um, you can maybe pivot and go down a customer discovery rabbit hole that you didn't know you needed at the beginning. I mean, there's a lot. Here's some examples. Marina, what would you do if you didn't have, you didn't want to just ask family and friends and you want to look for people to use these things. Um, I know you can go to the library when the library is open and back in normal times. Uh, mm -hmm. We can usually help you find groups of people that are willing to test out your products and stuff. But do you have any suggestions on where people could look for testers or focus groups? That's, yeah, that's a good question. I would say that when you're creating your wireframes and you're kind of linking them all together and, and creating a prototype, there is a way for you, you to extract a URL from your screens where you can send it to someone and they'll open it and it automatically feels like an app and they can kind of go through that. So I'm not really answering your question well, but it's incredibly easy to share out. So networking. So yeah, you know, networking. You're, you're like networking, you're trying to find the people that would be best users for this. And you're saying it's easy to do. You don't have to like create a focus group. It's easy yeah. to share. Yeah. And I okay. would say be, be intentional about who you're reaching out to. It doesn't have to be family and friends, uh, but it should be someone with who's thinking about your idea or is thinking about your industry. So for Dream Kit, right, when we weren't ready to show it to young people who are experiencing homelessness, we asked case managers, we asked, you know, housing directors, we asked people in that world, maybe not directly, but they, they knew kind of how our end user was thinking. Uh, and that sounds like that's not as hard now that you named the URL thing to do through email. 
Exactly. You're not having to call these people. You can reach out through email. You can, and there are groups of uh, that will create focus groups. You can Google them, um, and they will have people test things out for you. But I think they do include a fees. So if you can find people that you think um, organizations that you think will have people that are interested in your app or schools like education, like you want to, you know, someone that works at this school, email them. See if they'll share it. Um, it seems like email would be the way to do it yeah 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 and at this phase right now you are hungry for feedback and so once you can get let's say a hundred conversations down with a hundred different types of feedback like you're ready who knows like it's different by industry but um, the worst thing that you can do and this goes back to the money question is feel confident in your app you're like yeah i got some feedback i'm good to go and then push it to developers, they code it all, and then you bring it to your end customers and they don't actually like it. Maybe it's confusing, maybe it's you just, there's something wrong with it. And then you wasted a couple grand. Um, so, so again, all these things that I'm talking about, they're free, save your money, save your money and time down the road. Okay, uh, finding developers. So I talked about before, but students, in this ecosystem, there's a couple websites. So again, Colleen mentioned independent contractors from uh, Topdal, Upwork. There's some other ones that folks want to share in the chat. Uh, they exist and you can outsource and compromise on a, on a price that makes you feel good. And you know, the more screens you have, the more expensive it gets. So if you just want an app that's super simple, less than 10 screens, it's going to be cheaper than a more involved 50 plus screen app. And screens are everything. Uh, the second you click on a button and let's say a sidebar pops up, that's a different screen, right? So it's, it's like one of those picture books where you are flipping when we were younger, right? And then the little mm -hmm. character moves, like that's basically apps. Every single- Yeah, it's like a longer right? book takes more editing. So that makes sense. Okay. This is the last piece. So we're doing good. Uh, branding, I like skipped right through it. Branding and, and the personality of your brand. Uh, things to think about again, right? Always, always, always center your audience. You are not necessarily your audience. And it's really hard to step away because you know, you're, you're in your body forever and you, you have your mind forever. And uh, it's, it's easy to think that you are your audience, but you're not. Think of your personas. The second is kind of come up with some guiding principles. Like what, who, how do you want your customers to feel when they're experiencing your app? Um, so three words, you know, that you want to associate with, that you want your audience to think about. Dream Kits is like young and vibrant and bubbly and exciting. Uh, and then that comes across in the shapes that we pick, in the colors that we pick. I mean, everything's intentional. So if you wanted to essentially like vision board your app and come up with some adjectives, that would really help you. And if you want to bring on a designer, they're going to ask you like, what's your brand personality? You can give them these adjectives. Um, for example, green, I, I didn't know this, but like green symbolizes growth and maybe sometimes money. And, and so you, you think about it, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. But from a branding perspective, if that's one of your adjectives, then you're probably going to include green in your logo. So it's just, there's a lot of psychology there. Um, and right, describe the personality of your brand in a sentence or two. That'll be really happy. That's the pitch deck idea. You need to like as quick as possible be like, this is what this is. So. Yeah, yeah. I also have um, some friends who started a software for people like us, so early stage entrepreneurs, um, and they create your brand identity for you based mm -hmm. off of a survey. So you say like, hey, these are my three adjectives. This is what I want my like brand to kind of feel and look. And they'll pop up and say, hey, this is the font that works best for you and what you've described. These are the colors. These are the shapes. Mm -hmm. So cool. Like, um, do yeah, you want to put that in the chat? Yeah, 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 I'll share their, I'll share their resource at the end. I just recommended them last week, so. Oh, yeah. good. Okay. Uh, mentioned this before, colors are crazy. If you didn't know, every single color has a numeric value. And so um, there are websites that can kind of help you get accustomed to picking a color palette for your app, right? We've kind of talked about user personas, wireframing, prototyping, and now what is our brand? of the app, I really, really like, oh, it's below this, dang, it's below this picture. It's called Coolers, 
colors.co or cooler C O O. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll pull it up after <laughs> it's, it's great because it gives you color palettes and you can just randomize and um, think through. So yeah, I'll pull it up after. One thing that I want to touch on is accessibility, right? Not all of your customers maybe are going to have the same abilities as everyone else. So let's say you're working with someone who's colorblind or visually impaired completely. I mean, there, there's a whole range of what you're supposed to be thinking about when designing an app, colors being one of them. So you know, if there's not enough contrast, what does it mean for someone who's colorblind to like not be able to access your app just because you weren't thinking through um, all the potential end users when designing your app. So this is me just touching on the fact um, to think about accessibility when you're designing your app. And again, some resources that you will get after. Uh, elements is basically a word for buttons, maybe. Um, there's a bunch of elements in an app. So you can have in the navigation bar with like the X would be an element or um, those three lines that kind of push open a sidebar, that's an element. Um, and what's really cool is that on, I think Apple created a huge free open source database where they have like thousands of elements that you can use at, as you're creating and designing your app. So you don't have to go in there and kind of like, insert line, insert line and make an X, like those, those resources already exist. You can just download all the main elements of, you know, apps moving forward. So that's on elements. Oh my gosh, I think we made it. Okay, this, <laughs> these are a bunch of resources. One thing that I wanna chat about uh, in terms of photos, don't feel pressured to have to take the pictures you use in your app. There are crystal clear, beautiful stock photos available on unsplash.com. So this one right here and pexels.com. Love them. I like pexels because there's a lot of POC representation in there. Just a little plug. Icons, again, don't waste your time on things that already exist. A bunch of free icons available for you to use in your app. One from the Noun Project, another one from Flat Icon. There's uh, UI, so just aesthetically uh, websites to inspire you from, from an app perspective. Uh, CollectUI.com, uh, color, color browsers, right? Um, and illustrations. So a bunch of things, excited for you guys to dig through them. And the last one that I'll actually click on is I love that you included Linda. We're doing Linda for next month as our featured digital toolbox database because there's just so much you can learn on it. So much. Mm -hmm. Coolers. Coolers.co. Oh, colors.co. Oh. I thought it was coolers. Yeah. I'm on my roommate's computer and I'm struggling. Does anyone have um, questions as I struggle? As you struggle. We had someone uh, that asked in the questions, um, if they're not on Facebook, how will they access this? But we will have this recorded in our Facebook video catalog on our YouTube. Um, you just search I've squared NHFPL or New Haven Free Public Library, you'll find our, our videos. And we're gonna send out the slides to the people that, um, applied so we had some people join late uh but if you registered for this and you and you're on here we will get these slides to you oh bless okay here we are <laughs> thanks for being patient with me everyone this is what i was this is one resource that i'm recommending in terms of colors um if you can't necessarily get the right palette in your mind this one will help you easily just kind of randomize and think through what you want your brand to be Um, as it loads, anyone else have questions? I'll also load. Hmm. <laughs> okay, well, just trust me. So how does coolers work? You can give us like a sentence of how it works. 
Cool. Yeah. So you'll show up and they randomize color palettes for you. And so on the screen, you'll just click like go or get started. And like seven different shades will pop up. Um, actually, here we go. Cool. And you just click uh, start the generator. Mm. And then every time you click space bar, it'll randomize a new color palette. And so you can actually lock colors that you really like and then space bar and it randomizes again. Um, I really enjoyed it because I think thinking of five colors that work well together is not my forte. Mm. So this really helps. And then the other resource that I wanted to again remind you of is figma.com. Um, that's where you can absolutely create all the screens that you want. You can prototype. So right, connecting the screens to each other. And it's amazing, right? So space bar. And I'm just hitting space bar right now. And again, right, so here's not necessarily numeric, but sequential number of colors. So the hex value for this blue is, you know, A9, B, C, D, zero. Uh, and write so that down. So write it down. All and then right. every time you like use Figma, use Adobe XD, use Canva, any sort of design tool, they'll ask you like, hey, what color do you want? And if you know your hex value, throw it in here and we'll pull it up for you. So knowing that value is really, really important and valuable. Um, I would say one takeaway maybe mm -hmm. in, in building an app is to be kind to yourselves like we are not developers and that means that we have such a different perspective on this this app concept in the world and, and like feel ownership over your idea right it's a powerful beautiful idea it takes a team to get there um and just know that it's, it's a long process but it's so worth it so. And I would say, like, you're learning and creating something, you can put this on your resume. Yes. You're not an app developer because you didn't go to school for it, but you developed an app. Like, you, you, created, an app. you exactly. created all of this work in the beginning and you were part of the process. So learning this, it, I mean, it seems just so worth it. Yeah, yeah. And exactly what Colleen is saying, dream kit, right? I didn't just develop on the back end the code, but I had the idea and I led this team to get to this very beautiful end goal. And the commissioner of housing for, you know, Connecticut reached out and was like, Hey, we know about dream kit, super impressed that you're able to create accessible technology for low income folks. Like, can you help us on a rent relief project? Cause we're using tech and we want someone who has your skill sets to be in those rooms. So I think all that to say, in building an app, you will teach yourself this whole new world of what it means to um, create opportunities and, and create experiences for people through an app. Um, and that's such a transferable skill. And you'll have ownership over it, which I think is really important. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I didn't share the last screen, but I'm going to actually throw my email in the chat. Yeah, please do, because uh, we're losing Marina as our EIR for office hours, but she did promise that if anyone has any questions and reaches out, she will get back to you because she's fantastic. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Like if you want to hop on Zoom for 10 minutes and I can share my screen and, and kind of deep dive into something that you felt confusing, I can commit to that too. Like it, you're not alone in this and uh, there's going to be a lot of self-teaching, but it's doable, it's possible. And a lot of these Figma and Canva and these places have videos of how to's. So yeah. definitely keep that in mind. Yeah, this was oh, casting a wide net and exposing you to language and resources. If it didn't stick, that's okay. But Colleen was saying, yeah, deep dive into some YouTube videos. Um, that's what I Watch did. this again, go through the slides, check out the resources. I think this was really thorough. Thank you so much, Marina. This was great. You're so welcome. I appreciate everyone. Uh, thanks for being patient with me at the beginning. Chaos. <laughs> um, and hopefully some of you will reach out. And thank you all for sharing your night with me. I know you probably worked like an extensive work day. Um, I appreciate you all. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's it's Marina at I Dream. Just typed it in. Um, you have to select panelists and attendees or else it'll only send a panelist it's very bizarre so now it's on attendees so that's her email beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> all right well thank you everyone um i hope you continue coming to our 
our events for I've squared. I mean, we're going to keep having stuff like this going on in the coming months and good luck on your, on your apps, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye.